people tend to think they met and then they were famous. But of course, there were five years of hard work. Their early performances in Liverpool were quite raw, really. A lot of the gigs they weren't even paid for. They were just given drinks and things. They were regarded as a nothing group. In Liverpool in 1661, no one had really discovered us. You know, the likes of Rory Stone and Jerry and the pacemakers would knock us into a cock -tat. You know, they were the big stars and we were just like, you know, the lads on the ladder. John Lennon said, do you know what, Joe? If I don't make it with this band, he said, I'm going to get a ship and go up that river and I'll skip that ship in New York. They were just like average lads that you might meet down the football club or something, you know? Paul wants to be a window dresser. He said, don't you tell me what I want to be, Joe. I want to be a window dresser. He said, window dressing fascinates me. Liverpool's always been a hotbed of music, but never had the recognition for it. You know, jazz, you know, steel bands, you name it, skiffle. It's all emanated there. Liverpool was a pretty bleak place. Bleak and lonely. The black buildings, you know, and uh, certain, uh, very melancholy in a way. It was kind of biblical bleak. I mean, those storms and the light shafts cutting through and the, and the sea hitting up against that seawall. Yeah, it was pretty grim up north. The place was absolutely filthy. All these wonderful buildings that we see today were nearly all black. They had a lot of smoke coming from ships all over the place. You could cut, put it for a nice white shirt on in Liverpool and you'd come home and it'd have to be washed because there'd be black smut. I was bored on the 9th of October 1940 when I believe the nasties were still booming us, led by Madolf Heathlum, who only had one. Anyway, they didn't get me. Lennon particularly was a kind of street urchin. He persuaded himself that he was. He wasn't, of course. He was far more sophisticated and intelligent than that. If you go to Menlove Avenue, where John Lennon spent his childhood, you will see it's an absolutely lovely area, a long, long way away from uh, a working-class hero, really. A beautiful neighbourhood with a garden front and back, a park opposite. I mean, John probably was the, the most uh, privileged of the lot. Menlove Avenue is a very nice road, living with his Auntie Mimi. She was a cross between a headmistress and a librarian. In other words, intimidating. She was. She well, but I didn't want him wasting his time playing the guitar. What was I going to do if I had a boy of 21 thrown back on my hands, qualified for nothing? Did you get sent round the back door? Yeah. No, I Comes always... round the back, then. Okay. I always got in the front door. That's my claim to fame. Oh, well, well you probably dress properly. Well, I probably had a shirt, yeah. a shirt and tie on and a suit, because, you know, yeah, you look from, I was wearing... I looked like so. a scrub. She'd let the cats in through the front door, but <laughs> but us ruffians in front of the back. John was like uh, a naughty brother who you have to keep thinking, oh God, what's he going to do next? You know. I don't think many parents liked him. They used to refer to him as that Lennon. He was a bit of a handful. <laughs> at, the, at the local youth club, at, at, he was blamed for burning it, setting fire to it. You know, and maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but. The rest of them came from sort of council premises or terrace streets, you know, where there were outside loos and you had to have a bath in a tin tub. Paul McCartney lived on an estate about a mile away. Yeah, we used to rehearse in Paul's house, but I only remember his dad coming in and, and taking Mike out, saying, come on, leave him to it, you know. He's very strict with Paul and Mike. He sort of kept them in during the week. They were allowed out at the weekends, because he, he was left as a loan father to bring them up. Paul was law-abiding and studious, did his homework on time. I didn't meet his mum, apart from the fact I think she was the midwife who delivered me. George came from Wavertree area, and it was one of those small terraced houses. I don't know where they fitted them all in, they were like mother and father, George, three brothers, two brothers and Louise all squeezed into this little council house. Yeah, where the family was crowded together, but it was quite sort of warm and nice atmosphere of those. The people of those times were really good neighbours. 
His dad worked on the buses, so if you ever saw you waiting for a bus, he'd just pick you up and let you get on free. And George also was our butcher's delivery boy. He used to stop at my house and me and mum would make him some beans on toast and a cup of tea and we'd play, listen to records. People say he was the choir people and he was in one way because he let the other two do all the talking because they did, you know. Um, but he, he wasn't quiet, you know. He, but he was very thoughtful, George. Paul and George used to get on the bus and go to school together. And George started carrying his guitar to school and sort of singing in the back of the bus. The origin of the Beatles was a group called the Quarrymen, which John had formed at Quarry Bank School. Somebody suggested getting the band together, a group yeah. together, so John and, and Eric decided to learn guitar. They went to some guy in Hunts Cross and they realised it was going to take a year to learn to read dots. So it was too complicated. They gave up, so they went to John's mum, Julia, and she taught them banjo chords. Banjo chords, yeah. Most people think of only John, Paul, George and Ringo, but if you look right through the different lineups of the Beatles, starting with the Quarrymen, you'll find about 25, 26 people in there. Well, I joined the group because I, I wanted to sing. I wanted to be a singer. I didn't particularly want to play a TGS bass, but John says, well, Bill Smith doesn't turn up for rehearsals. Do you want to come in on the TGS? That was 1955. So the, this Quarrymen, which John Lennon formed, was very much a makeshift group. If somebody just said, you know, we're having a party, do you want to come and perform? We were there, we were only performing. It's probably the competition. We wanted a bit of competition. No, we wanted we to stand up good, no, and knew. impress the girls. Nothing to do with <laughs> competition. That's what it was all about. That girl's well, looking at me. Let's anybody. play loud. That girl's looking at me. <laughs> the Quarrymen weren't very good, as far as I remember. and then Paul McCartney joins. So we went to this uh, village fete, or we were both there together, and um, I got to know John through, through Ivan. Uh, and normally, you know, you'd be talking to people in conversation, so they what's your hobbies, or I like doing this, or like cycling, or like swimming, or... And I would say to people, I like songwriting, you know, I've written a couple of songs, and everyone would go, oh yeah, and ignore it. But John went, oh yeah, so have I. So that was like, hmm? <laughs> what, you wrote a couple songs? Yeah, so, well, show me yours and I'll show you mine, baby. <laughs> Once Paul McCartney got in the band, they knew they wanted to do 20 Flight Rock, Eddie Cochran song, for example. Uh, they knew they wanted to do rock and roll, and the skiffle was starting to sound a bit old hat. Well, you may go to college, you may go to school, you may have a pink Cadillac, but don't you be nobody's fool. And now, baby, baby, come back, baby, come, come back, baby, come, come back, and baby, I won't play high with you. Elvis Presley, Eddie Cochran, Jerry Lee Lewis, Gene Vincent, Buddy Holly and Little Richard. Those were the names that the Beatles were really influenced by. The cabin itself banned rock and roll. You weren't allowed to play. It was a jazz venue. Skiffle was regarded as a form of jazz, and it was a jazz club, so that was acceptable. Rock and roll was taboo. John, Paul and Eric and myself were improving quite a bit. We were going on to much more rock and roll kind of music. And John wanted to play All Shook Up and all these rock and roll numbers. So we were mixing it on the, on the set list. Alan Sittner, who was running the cavern, he didn't want any rock and roll at the cavern. He didn't want John Lennon doing Elvis songs. Well, they took some honey. Sure enough, I was halfway through the song, a note was passed up. From a tree. Can you cut out the rock or else? Dressed it up and they called me. Everybody's trying to be my baby. Everybody's we just kept on playing. Everybody's trying to be my baby now. 
all the jazz crowd booed them and throwed coins at them. And, and they were fined, Ray McFall fined them. But they picked the coins up, the, the, up from the floor and there was more money than they were getting paid for the gig. Pick the money up. Say thank you. They soon stopped throwing it. And when George joined, he just carried on as the quarryman doing pretty much rock and roll music. George was the talented one. <laughs> yeah, you just nobody ever realised that. What a good guitarist George was, you know, because I mean John was a hopeless guitarist. So George started off at under mile an hour and before you knew it he was into <laughs> I, I just lost <laughs> I couldn't you lost do a, I couldn't you keep lost a beat. It. it just it was just a so you let them carry on. Right. Just let them carry on. You're the drummer. And it didn't help because Nigel was standing down the front of the stage. <laughs> he shouted, "Oh, Cole's missed the beat. Cole's lost the beat." <laughs> but then they stopped performing completely. They'd more or less packed in, given up. I'd had enough after a while because there was no. We didn't have cars. I was carrying them drums on and off buses all the time. Basically, they weren't going anywhere. So I eventually I just gave up. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Some people might say, well, the first place the Beatles played and became famous was on the Cabin Club. But you've got to be honest and say, no, they played on the Casbah first. Mona Best had a little club in the basement of her house called the Casbah. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Stuart Sutcliffe, obviously Pete Best since our mother owned the house where the Casbah was started, the Casbah Club, but the boys had to get involved in decorating the club, getting it ready for opening night. Um, John Lennon had three attempts at this ceiling. His first attempt, he did three-toed, pot-bellied, scrawny-like figures on it. Mo hated them. His second attempt was to paint it green, which Mo also hated. And his third attempt, which was acceptable, was John's interpretation of Aztec Mexican artwork, hence the ceiling being known as the Aztec ceiling. My mother was looking for a band to open the club. She said, um... Do you know anyone who might be interested? George basically turned around and said, I happen to know a couple of guys who aren't doing anything at the moment. And Mo said, you know, bring them down, you know, let's have a look at them. And they came down the next day, uh, and lo and behold, they turned out to be John Lennon and Paul McCartney. My mother put the deal to them. She said, you know, we want a residency, and the band can play every Saturday. She gave them the price, which was three pound, you know, which was a lot of money in those days. This is the original stage area. This is where the lads started on the 29th of August, 1959. The lineup that night was John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ken Brown, who were the reformed quarrymen. That lineup with the quarrymen opened the Casbah for us. No drummer, just four guitarists. Yeah, incredible. And the Casbah is always one place that people want to go, because it's still like a museum. The Casbah became the catalyst for what the world knows today as the Mersey Beat Sound. The stage area here, this is where the Beatles first played in this country, in the UK. Their first show in Liverpool as the Beatles was on the 17th of December 1960 here at the Casbah Coffee Club and this was the stage that they played on. I first met John in 1958 at Liverpool College of Art and I saw this guy come striding past. He looked like a teddy boy. I thought, that guy is different, you know? He's a bit of a rebel. I must get to know him. John was a rebel, an individual, and very enigmatic. I just couldn't resist him. I knew there were easier men in the world. In fact, I was going out with a very easy, boring man at the time. I and mean, John just, just lifted me away from all this, and he was just the most outrageous character I'd ever come across, and I loved him for it. John was a great character, and people wanted to sort of be around him, but not that on the wrong side of his tongue, you know. He had a cutting sense of humour, almost to the verge of being nasty. And the girls in the college used to be dead afraid of John. Uh, if they'd be talking in the corridors and he came along, they all kept quiet, afraid of what he might say to them. 
Like Marmite, some people liked him, some people didn't like him. He could be moody, you know, like us all, you know, got out the wrong side of the bed one day, and you never knew what mood John was in until he started talking to him. We occasionally bumped into each other in, say, the life drawing class. All these little drawings were about cripples and people with one eye or one leg, and maybe, it was, I don't know, maybe some sort of self-defense thing. I mean, he was terrible with all that, all that. When people came in, he was, I mean, he was naughty completely. He was out of, I mean, it was, it was funny. I mean, we thought it was funny, but it was Liverpool. You know, you still do it now. You take the mick out to somebody, you know, it's just part of our growing up. They think your uh, haircuts are un-American. Well, it was very observant of them, because we aren't American. <laughs> John was a strange character. His mum was run over quite early on when he was at college. Didn't mention it to anybody. Well, there were two sides of John. There was the side that the public saw, which was the caustic, abrasive, devil-may-care, you know, and the other side, which was a very tender and a very loving person. John was somewhat anxious to get away from the home environment where he was treated more like a little boy. Uh, number nine, Percy Street. Where Stuart spent, spent most of our time when we were students, along with John, Cynthia and everybody else that wanted to come to a party. First of all, we lived in the back room on the first floor. Eventually, of course, we had to move because we'd been caught burning bits of furniture that were in the basement. But we had a good time here, and this is where they wanted a bass guitarist, and we were practicing uh, in one of the rooms with the tape recorder, and both Stuart and I offered to be bass guitarist. So I thought, I'll make a bass guitar, carving it out of wood, and I didn't have any money to get the strings, but I thought, well, one day, after I'd done a bit more scaffolding work, Stuart Sutcliffe got some money through uh, painting being purchased by uh, the John Moores family and so he got a bass guitar. He got the job. I didn't. That seemed to go quite well until the Beatles started rehearsing in the back room and we started getting complaints from the agents saying that uh, there was too much noise, and noise, Beatles, noise, ridiculous. They went and auditioned for Larry Pons. Tommy Moore was their regular drummer at that time, and they did a tour for Larry Pons in Scotland, back in Johnny Gentle. It was a bummer, you know, it didn't happen. Tommy Moore came back from that and he said, I've had enough playing drums, I'm going back to being a forklift truck driver at Garston Bottle Works and off he put it. So that left a berth for drums. Harry Case and the Seniors were the very first Liverpool group to go to Hamburg via Alan Williams, a local promoter. I came down to the club one night and there was no steel band. And uh, my waitress, Audrey, said, didn't you know they've gone to Hamburg? Well, it could have been out of Mongolia for, you know. And so they wrote to me saying, you should come over to Hamburg. And we went to this club called the Kaiser Keller. And uh, there was an awful German band playing uh, with no rhythm, just singing. I can still hear the guy singing, Tutti Frutti, oh Rudy Tutti. And the kids were bored. So I found out where the manager, uh, who he was, and uh, I sold them the idea of having, uh, you know, bands from Liverpool. And Bruno Koshmead asked for another Liverpool band. So Alan Williams asked Rory Stone, the Hurricanes, the most obvious ones, but they were booked to go to for a summer season at Butlins, so they couldn't do it. Then he asked uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers, but Jerry Marsden was working on the railway and he wouldn't, wouldn't give up his jobs. So in desperation, he turned to the Beatles. The Beatles had got a booking in Hamburg, but the contract stipulated that they had to have a drummer. I got a phone call from Paul. Wasn't expecting it. And he turned around and said, we've had the offer to go to Germany, Pete. Um, how would he be fixed about joining the band and playing drums? Pete was a very good looking lad. 
people say that Pete had the James Dean look, you know. Smashing guy, good, solid, thumpy, loud drummer. And then lo and behold, which was the funniest thing of all, they'd seen me playing, he said, well, you've got to audition, Pete. So I landed up at the Blue Angel Club. They were all there. Blasted off about six numbers, which everyone knew. They went away in a corner for about 10 minutes. Alan Williams, who was the manager, was taking us out to Hamburg at that time, came in. John and Paul shouted out, this is the new drummer, Alan. You know, so Alan said, they made you audition in case you asked for more money. So I said, well, it's nice to know, but whatever they're getting suits me. Mm -hmm. A couple of days after that, we were on our way to Hamburg. Well, they took some honey from a tree. You can imagine um, an old dormer van. It must have been about 11 or 12 people in it. You know, there's more equipment on top of the van than what there was inside. I woke up last night, half past four, 15 women knocking at my door. Sing alongs, we nearly froze to death on the ferry going over, but that's another story altogether. Everybody's trying to be my baby now. When we saw the Reaper Bomb, it was just absolutely incredible. It's just this maze of neon lights, you know, absolutely spellbinding. We'd never seen anything like it before. The red light district was pretty notorious at that time. And they were in some pretty seedy areas of Hamburg. Especially in the San Pauli area. It was gangster controlled. It was, you know, the red light district of the world at that time. But it, be, it was very violent. And it took us a while to actually recognise that. But we're from Liverpool without blowing our own trumpets. We have a reputation of being able to look after ourselves. We thought we were going to be playing the Kaiser Keller. Bruno Koschmieder was the manager. He basically turned around and said, no, 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 you're not playing here, Derry's playing here, you know. You're playing at a club further down the road. They were told, oh, you're not at the Kaiser Keller, you're at this other little club former strip club called the Indra. So we said, okay, let's go and have a look at it. So we walked down the Gross of Freiheit and away from the neon lights and the colour and the crowd. And we came to the Indra and we dashed in. Two people in there, you know, arguing over the price of a beer. And he turned around and said, you have got to make this into another Kaiser Keller. That was the challenge. When we went out to Germany, we were, I'll be quite honest, we were average, you know, um, compared with other bands in Liverpool. But we went out to captivate the German audience six, seven hours a night, six, seven nights a week. The Beatles were very irreverent, really, and I like to look back now and think that they were the first punk group. A few times we got warned, you know, a couple of the waiters came up and, you know, the managers came up and sort of turned around and said, it's getting a little bit too risky, that's... We all decided in the break that we'd all get dressed up. And John decided that he was going to go on in the swimming trunks. And as the crowd's gone wild, our antics are getting wilder and wilder and wilder. And one of us turned around and went, you won't show your backside to the German audience, right? Famous last words. Middle of a number, guitar strung round his neck. John turned round. <laughs> And he just flashed his backside to the audience, but he just didn't flash it. He just left it up there till the end of the song. You can just imagine that this pink derriere standing here in the face, like that, you know, not far from it. Um, and they were hysterical, you know, we were hysterical. John Poeface just basically pulled his trunks up again, continues the next number till the next break. But the funny thing that happened after that, the following night, they wanted that to be done again. They thought that that was going to be part of the show. So we had to explain to them, no, it was just a one-off. As far as the Beatles were concerned, I had heard about them when I first went there. Everyone was talking about them. You saw their picture up there. So you thought maybe there's something special. Pete created what was called the Atom Beat, a way of pounding, pounding sound. You used to have to turn everything up full blast. And, you know, I used to have to develop a beat which would keep everything locked together so it was a lot of bass drum work and a lot of tom-tom work. He sort of created the Beatles sound. He played the drums so loud to cover up for the sort of turned down bass sound of Stuart. 
And it was sort of a bit of an affectation that Stuart was playing with his back to the audience and with sunglasses on. And it was largely so that he could see the strings and, and play. <laughs> I don't think this went down terribly well with Paul, who wanted uh, professional bass players. Everyone was jealous of Stu, I'll be quite honest, because, you know, Astrid was this gorgeous German girl. One of the first letters I got from him mentioned meeting this girl, who was a photographer, and he was really taken with her. She walked in, and she was dressed in leather. And she was a beautiful-looking girl, anyway. Um, but we were spellbound leather, you know. The Beatles had an image that they brought back with them, which wasn't fully formed, but it had begun. Um, they, they'd got the leather jackets, which was still sort of old hat in a way, I mean, old rock and roll style. We all dashed out and got leather jackets. Because our stage clothes were basically falling to bits, OK, and it was also the idea, leather's cheap, we can wear leather on stage, off stage, basically live in it. Paul was the last, he eventually got one, but it took him quite a while afterwards. And that, for some unknown reason, became our trademark. And even when we came back to Liverpool, that was the image we brought back. The first time I saw the Beatles was on the Little and Town Hall. They'd just come back from Hamburg after being there for about six months, perhaps. And they exploded onto the stage. Suddenly they had stage presence, they had a show. They uh, knew how to entertain, they knew how to engage with the audience. You know, people were flabbergasted. Uh, they didn't know how to take us. The first time we played with them was St John's Hall Doodle. I came home from work and I bought the Echo to see who was on with us tonight. And it was uh, from Hamburg, the Silver Beatles. I thought, who the hell are they? You know? <laughs> and I watched them and they were fantastic. Other groups were sort of came on, were in suits and played. and didn't communicate with the audience as much as they did. In Britain at that time, it was uh, pretty pop stars in shiny suits, uh, choreographed shadows walking and uh, nice bright guitars. They were just you know, actually smoking on stage. They had their amps on chairs. At one point, um, they were talking all German on stage because they could speak fluent German. People thought they were a German band direct from Hamburg and thought, oh, they don't all speak uh, good English for, um, for Germans, you know? Just the clothes convinced us that they were German. We were wearing leather jackets, we were wearing polo necks, we had cowboy boots. Um, our hair had grown long. We were wearing, at that time, you may laugh, red v-neck jumpers. <laughs> so uh, we thought, oh, I think we'd better look at ourselves here. And we did, we just took note of the Beatles. Never seen so many kids start to dress in leather jackets in Liverpool after that. Of course, the music we were playing as well behind it. You know, the two and two went hand in hand together. A raw energy, savage band that we were, a great rock and roll band. And the audience that were dancing actually stopped and walked towards the stage and watched them. And we thought, this is something special here. Anyone who didn't enjoy that stuff of Hamburg must have missed something. We were earning what was a small fortune in Britain, and I bought my very first car from my first month's stay at the Star Club. That's how good it was. You mixed with all the musos, and so you played with Gene Vincent, Jerry Lee, Ray Charles, Fats Domino, the Everleys, Joey D. You played with all these people, so you're learning all the time. It was a great school. No one in Great Britain outside Liverpool knew who were the Beatles, who King Size Tale, The Undertakers, the Big Three, one of the best bands, or Jerry and the Pacemakers. Completely unknown. And suddenly we realised there was a force there. John and I were the ones who, you know, we propped the bars up and we'd talk about, you know, home and all the other bits and pieces. Normally you'd be walking home in daylight, early hours of the morning, and you'd either go down to the Siemens Mission by the, the, the port and get your chips and egg or your steak and then you go home to bed and sleep most of the afternoon. 
Uh, Germany allowed them to express themselves. They, they did do the most outrageous things on stage. I mean, uh, John Lennon making Nazi salutes and swearing all the time, but partly because there was a, a language problem. And he thought it was quite funny to do, you know, call them Nazis and the Heil Hitler sign and all the other bits and pieces. They loved it. You know, half of them didn't know what he was talking about anyway. <laughs> The Beatles had a very strong following that, that they engineered in Hamburg. I and mean, when they came back, they played to that audience. I mean, the Cavern Club was pretty notorious for having a very strong female contingent there. It was girls with curlers in their hair and, and a scarf over on the top, you know. It was very small time. I lived in the Cavern. Every time they were on, I was there. It was the only club in Liverpool that done lunchtime sessions. You could go to hear music in your dinner hour. The cavern was a strange place, you know, you've, you've been there, it's a filthy hole. It was a black door in the street and a bouncer leaning against the door, Paddy, and you went down one flight of stone stairs into this cellar. To these little vaulted rooms where people stood like sheep in a cattle train, you know. Get your gear down the cavern when it's packed, so it, it was hard, but we were young and we enjoyed it. Health and safety wouldn't have even allowed people to go into it nowadays. Hot, sweaty, smelly, with water running down the walls. At least we hope it was water. There's clouds of smoke mingling with the perspiration on the wall. And smelt. <laughs> smelt of death. <laughs> Couldn't deny that you'd been to the cavern because you'd, you'd have a smell on your clothes. Um, and it was a unique smell. I know some people say it was a you know, all because of urine and things like that. If it wasn't smelling of cabbage, it was smelling of some disgusting oh. dettol that they were throwing around the toilets See, at we, the time. That's just a nice <laughs> picture, yeah, that's a nice picture. <laughs> but it was blended in with, because there was a fruit marker's opposite. So, you know, you had the smell of orange, and um, I'm sure if I could bottle it, I could make a fortune. But of course it was the, show place for a lot of Liverpool bands and the atmosphere in there when it was packed was electric. Everybody was standing in the same few square yards right in front of the stage just looking up at them. They were all popular but Pete was the one. And the girls used to just stand and look at Pete and even chant you know at the, after the end of songs. Fans would sleep outside Mona Best's home where they'd just be near Pete Best. I mean, he had that kind of following early on, which really none of the other Beatles had quite to that degree. The Beatles were getting a bit fed up. They wanted to break out of Liverpool. They were still playing the cavern to crowds, but a bit static, nothing was happening. And then Brian Epstein came on the scene. Well, everybody knew he was, because he was the manager of the biggest record shop. He had very good ears for a hit single. Of course, he had that ability to listen to a record that was being plugged by buyers when they came into the shop and say, that one's a hit, that isn't a hit. Brian was telling me he was interested in this band that was playing at the Cavern, and he did ask me to go and listen to them. And I sat on the steps halfway down, I listened to them playing Hey Babe. And I went back and he said, what do you think? I said, if you don't take them, somebody will come along and take them. And he looked at me and he said, such as yourself. I said, possible. I said, they're very good. Brian was mesmerised by us when he first saw us on stage. You know, whether it was the leathers or attributes, whatever, you know, he fell in love with. Brian came from an upper middle class Liverpool Jewish background. They were respectability in Liverpool personified. A very, a very gentle man, very uh, clever man. Middle class, probably. And he was like coming down to all these working class lads. The Beatles always came to my house because John, uh, Brian's mum wouldn't agree to four lads in denims and so there was no Beatles allowed in that home. What you've got to give Brian credit for was he was the one who took the gamble with these five uncut diamonds. After Brian's death, when I talked to his mother, Queenie, it was clear that she still couldn't reconcile herself with the fact that their son had kind of slummed it with these people. <laughs> 
big difference with Brian Epstein is that he was someone with vision. Brian was the only person who could see over the Mersey. Brian was a fantastic promoter. Um, not, a good, not a great businessman, that didn't do great deals, but he gave them his, his soul. His strength, as well as his weakness, was his adulation for the band. It was almost obsessive. The Beatles fulfilled a need in him. I think he was very restless. He had a low boredom threshold. And they provided an outlet for his showbiz theatrical ambitions. Because he wanted to be a star himself. He was like a frustrated star. Or an actor, an actor, he used to say. These boys are going to be bigger than Elvis. That was his classic line. All the time he used it before he'd even had a record out, you know. And he believed it. He sincerely believed it. The simple fact was his vision was very clear. They were going to be big and he was going to help them. London controlled the entire music industry. Apart from Mersbeat, every major music paper was down there. All the national press was down there. All the agents, managers. And up to then, you had to go down to London to make it. Brian worked hard to promote the Beatles to get the deal. You know, he trundled around London. People were ignoring him. People said to me, they'll make a mincemeat of him in London. But they, they won't get anything. You needed a record. A record was everything. It was, it was like the holy grail. Get a record. Brian hawked the tapes around London, basically every record studio. Went to Philips, went, went to Polydor, went to everybody. Nobody wanted them. In desperation, Brian had taken tapes to Tony Meehan, who was the Shadows drummer, who at that time was working as an A&R man for Dick Rowe. I recall Brian collared him at some press reception and said, Tony, have you had a chance to listen to those tapes yet by the Beatles? And Tony Mingan said, I'm a very busy man, Mr. Epstein. I think Tony Mingan was about 19 at the time, anyway. Biggest turn down was Decker. Poor old Dick Rowe always gets it in the neck for being the man who turned down the Beatles at Decker Records. Dick Rowe recorded the Beatles down in London and Epstein chose which songs to sing things like the Sheik of Araby, which was totally wrong. Hello, little girl was okay, but you know, better me mucho. If you listen to the demos, a lot of them aren't particularly good. It's New Year's Day, everybody's a bit hungover, they've had a horrendous drive. Um, it's a bit flat. As John would say later, he said, he was right to turn us down, we were awful. <laughs> it wasn't just Dick Rowe, it was uh, right across the border. EMI, Pi, they all turned down those tapes. And it was only by sheer luck that Brian Epstein persisted and took those tapes back to EMI when he heard that George Martin had been away on holiday when he'd made his rounds previously and he was somebody he hadn't tackled. We decided on what we were going to play. And after that was in the lap of the gods, you know, whether we got signed or we didn't. The way in which they were signed to EMI was quite tortuous, and George Martin had his doubts. In June 1962, the Beatles went down to Parlophone uh, and were recorded by George Martin and did a version of Love Me Do. And if you hear that version of Love Me Do, for whatever reason, Pete Best sounds like he's banging a couple of bin lids on that record. He just had an off day, and George Martin said, we've got to use a, a session drummer when we do this song again. They could only think about, we've got one chance with a record in, in London, that's it, you know. And so I think that made the others think, well, this is time for him to go. My departure from the band, no. There was no inkling at all, whatsoever. Um, you know, that's still a mystery today. It was terrible what happened to him, you know. You know you, I mean, poor Pete, to be told, on the brink of the first recording, that you're out. Now, there have been so many excuses, but uh, we've had no actual reason as to why Peter should leave. As I say, success mm. is hard to come by, and these things do happen. But it's just the way that it was done that has annoyed us. What do they say mainly? Well, you know, the drummer wasn't too good, the beat wasn't so hot, you know. The reason it was given, it wasn't a good enough drummer. <laughs> 
people who saw me play then and people who've seen me play since then have turned around and said, no, that wasn't the decision. If you listen to his early drummer or hear any of his stuff, it's just as adequate a drummer as Ringo, if not better. Then that, that opens up the enclave into what the decision was. And then you got all the other bits, jealousy, hairstyle, blah, 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 goes on. Um, so I suppose the biggest myth is, right, I'm not, influ not influencing it, it's a public decision, that's why I turn around and say, right, I'm not a bad drummer, okay, let the people make their own mind up about that. I think maybe the drumming was used as an excuse to get rid of him. Unfairly. Clash of personalities, well, probably that may be it, because it's, Peter was, uh, did have a terrific fan club, you know, mm. compared to the others. It's too so, good looking, perhaps, eh? Well, I'll leave that for the other people to say, but if it had been done a bit more straightforward, it would have been more to the mark. We had a lot of trouble with Pete's mother, uh, Mona Best. She was constantly ringing up Brian Epstein and saying, what are you going to do for Pete's band? And Brian Epstein didn't like that at all. Brian phoned me and said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to let the band go. He said, uh, maybe you'd be interested. I said, why? He said, I can't get over Mrs. Best. He said, she's just, you know, overpowering. So we had discussed that it might be better to get rid of Mrs. Best by getting rid of Pete. He looked great and he was a great drummer, a lovely man. But he just was not, didn't have the same humour as the other three, or the same way of life. You can't change your personality. Pete's very quiet. You know, I liked Pete, but... Um... It was different, and that probably didn't work too well when you're away a long time together and stuck together. We'd drive back from Newcastle, and he'd go home, but we'd still go finish the night off somewhere. You know. The other three were so outgoing, and I think they needed somebody outgoing. You know. I see the Beatles as being essentially pragmatic. Once they'd been grounded and focused by Epstein, they had a collective ambition and anything that stood in the way of that ambition would be sacrificed, and I'm afraid I think Peter, Pete Best was. But uh, the way I look at it, you know, just let it lie now. Except right. for the reports in the papers, and I know it gets me a bit niggled at times. The reaction from people in Liverpool was absolutely incredible. There was demonstrations, a, a march to the city, bring back Pete. You know, there were riots in Matthew Street, posters, Ringo Never, Pete Forever. And George got punched in the face. There was lots of trouble. Even Ringo Starr was threatened. I used to be good mates of Ringo. Well, you know, before the replacements took place. We're still mates now, like. But I haven't seen him to have a chat with him or anything like that. It was very heartwarming for myself, um, seeing the support I had. Um, but deep down inside, I knew that the decision had been made, you know. And regardless of what happened, you know, the door wasn't going to be opened again. Ringo had played with the Beatles on occasions when Pete Best had been ill, so they knew they could get on well with him. He fitted into the band more perfectly as a personality. He tried to fit in. He sitting chatting and having a, a toasted cheese sandwich and a scotch and coke, you know. And we, we, everyone became very fond of him. I would class Ringo as the happy Beatle. You know, he was always dancing and singing along with different songs or humming a song, you know. I've always said Ringo was a very lucky person. And I was sitting here in this room one night with Paul McCartney, and I said, there's one lucky person, isn't there, Paul? And he said, don't go down there, Joe. He said, leave him alone. It was like the final piece in the jigsaw, you know, it? of Beetledom. It's that indefinable element. You just know when something works and something doesn't. And in particular with music, where it is so much to do with feel and instinct, that's very important. They eventually got a recording contract to make the first sort of record. Brian came home to Lime Street and we were all waiting there for him. 
and it was like the Prime Minister who was waving the paper at the beginning of the war. He said, success, success. George Martin didn't think they were going to be this fantastic band. He gave them a tiny royalty and, you know, thought, well, and tried them, you know. Eventually they came out with the number Love Me Do, but it didn't have much impact in the music paper charts. In those days, you could buy your way into the charts, and Love Me Do wasn't doing too well, so he ordered 10,000 to help it along. Brian bought them, stocked the shops and sold them. It's, <laughs> he was a record retailer, first and foremost. So of course, it went to number one in Merseybees. It was our number. We were the only people to have that record as a number one record. People didn't believe that Liverpool was selling all these records, but they were. The impact it had on kids around the country was sort of tremendous. It was something different, something new. I got shivers down my spine when I heard them singing on the radio and I thought, this is ridiculous. I've seen these guys playing so many times and now they're on the wireless. I could see that something was going to happen. And please, please, we went to number one, the second one, and you knew something was going to happen. Suddenly there's John, Paul and George, and I what the bloody hell are they doing on the telly? <laughs> and that was it. And uh, after that, you couldn't pick up a newspaper without them having the hair cut. The phone Brian said, can we have the Beatles for a photo session? And Brian's answer was, yes, if you send a limo to the Westmoreland Hotel. I said, we don't send limos for Cliff Richard. Not a prissily. And Brian said, these boys are going to be bigger than Elvis Presley, never mind Cliff Richard. <laughs> so, <laughs> we sent a limo. I could not believe that the Beatles that I was seeing in the cavern were actually on our biggest theatre in Liverpool. To me, that, that was it, they were famous. And I think that was the point where I thought, oh dear, I think that I should have finished that guitar. <laughs> Missed out here. <laughs> if you're going to be a star, Liverpool wasn't big enough. They had to move down to London. You know, it, it was inevitable. And people did feel left behind. There was some animosity. But it had to happen. You know, the Beatles were always very aware of their roots. They didn't sort of say, we're, we're off now. They said, come with us, we're going to be, want our pals all around us. The pals would keep them, keep them real. You use the word joy about the best moments of it. That's a very strong word, joy. Was it that much fun? Oh, yes. It's just something that went on and on and on and got better and better and bigger and bigger. And being in the centre of it, you just got swept along. There was always like that idea, oh, it's all going to stop tomorrow, <laughs> you know. It never did. Followed You One when it was released in 1995 had, I think, 12 tracks featuring Pete Best and that the worldwide sales of it were over 13 million. Out of the blue, we got a phone call from Paul McCartney. Paul was honourable and gave Pete what he was due. My life since then has been absolutely incredible. You know, I've still got a great band which tours the world. They do a lot of Beatles songs. And I asked him why once, he said, well, because they're bloody good songs. You know, why wouldn't you? I'm still alive, still healthy, still go for a pint, still enjoying myself, uh, I've got a great family. You know, wife I've been married to for 50 odd years, daughters, grandchildren. I've had a wonderful life. I hope it continues. You remember being part of a huge revolution that changed the music of the world. The Beatles turned the whole recording scene upside down. They were, as Brian Epstein memorably said, bigger than Elvis. They were four Elvises. They were that big. Every day with the Beatles, it was a joy, a laugh and an adventure. <laughs>